Hello, I'm Zachary Aldo, and in this video, I will be summarizing the paper Scheduling Workflows with Deadline and Budget Constraints Using Genetic Algorithms by G.I.U. and Rajkumar Bhuya. So, the solution addressed in this paper will focus on grid technologies based on utility computing. The topic to be discussed will be the optimization of workflow scheduling by minimizing two quality of service constraints, deadline or time and budget or cost. Um, workflow scheduling is considered an NP hard problem, which means that this is a very complicated subject. Um, and while reviewing the content of this paper, we will discuss how you can employ genetic algorithms to enhance workflows and actually solve this issue. So genetic algorithms employ the evolutionary theory, the concept that a better solution will be produced in each consecutive generation. So a genetic algorithm contains a population of one dimensional strings, which are called individuals or chromosomes. These are each considered separate solutions and the amount of solutions in each generation can also be set at a predetermined value. The process of developing a genetic algorithm can be described like this. So first, an initial population is created consisting of randomly generated chromosomes. Once this has been done, new offspring will be formed after applying genetic operators such as crossover and mutation. After the offspring have been created, the fitness value of each chromosome in the population will be determined. And then you keep the top solutions and continuously repeat the process of reproduction and evaluation to cultivate an optimal solution. Um, and the fitness value is calculated using the fitness function to determine how good an individual is compared to the rest of the population. We will see how to actually calculate our fitness value, as well as discuss the genetic operators in the following slides. So each chromosome in the population is made up of a vector of task assignments. Every task assignment contains the task ID, the service ID, which is the virtual machine that the task is running on, and the start and end times. Um, the approach taken by the paper is to not consider the start and end times in your schedule when applying the genetic operations because the space will be extremely large. The technique utilized is to apply the time slot assignment method after the genetic operators have finished. And we know what the schedule is going to look like for the string. Um, the time slot assignment is calculated and is similar to shift. So to solve the workflow scheduling problem at a minimum, the solution must follow a few conditions. The tasks can only be started after the predecessor has finished. Each task can only appear once in the schedule, and each task must be allocated to one available time slot of a service to execute the task. So in the global schedule, you can see here, uh, you can see the task assignments to each virtual machine. The S values are the service IDs and are the virtual machines, and the T values are the task IDs. In the schedule shown, you can see that it follows all the requirements set that I mentioned previously. Each of these tasks is only being executed after its predecessor has been completed. So. For example, T0 is executed, then T2, and then T7. So T2 can't start before T0 has been completed. Um, but since T0 and T1 are running on different services or virtual machines, they can both start running at the same exact time. Each task is also appearing only once and is put into an available time slot for each service, so there's no overlap. It's sequential. However, the strings are currently 2D and they need to be converted to a one-dimensional string for genetic manipulation. So all you need to do is combine the tasks ordered by service ID from low to high. 
So if you look here, you can see the two-dimensional string, and um, it's being changed to a one-dimensional string down here. So you can see that the service ID, so there's service are service ID one, two, three, four. So it starts off by assigning service ID one and all the tasks. So it adds zero, two, and seven. So T zero, T two, and T seven. <coughs> and once those have been assigned, um, it moves on to the next virtual machine. So virtual machine two has only T one, which is then assigned to the one dimensional string. And then S three, T3, T5, and then S4 has T4 and T6. So uh, <clears throat> the string can be converted back to a two-dimensional string once the, manip once the manipulation has <clears throat> once the manipulation has been completed. And make sure to consider that when you're converting back, some tasks might have switched their virtual machine location just depending on the type of um, genetic operators used. So the first type of genetic operator discussed in the paper is crossover. And crossover mutation is used to create new chromosomes in the current population by rearranging some parts of already existing individuals. The process attempts to develop enhanced chromosomes by combining the two most optimal solutions. So as shown in the picture above, the two parents are selected from the population and all of the tasks can be used for the crossover. So the parents are first converted into one dimensional strings and then the crossover begins. So you can see that parent one's T7 in virtual machine one is being swapped with parent two's T7, which is in virtual machine seven. And this can cause the virtual machine difference that I just mentioned a minute ago. And so offspring one is going to inherit this task assignment from parent two because they crossed it over. And also, Offspring one will inherit all of the tasks that did not cross over. So offspring one will get T0, T2, T4, T6, in addition to the crossed over values of T7, T8, and T5. So you can see them here at T0, T2, and then the crossover values. And the same goes for offspring two and inherits the values from parent two that did not cross over and then parent one's crossover values. So the next type of genetic operator was mutations and mutations are used in order to give children traits that are not possessed by either parent. So this allows for more diversification of the algorithm and provides an opportunity for better solutions. Shown here are swapping mutation on top and replacing mutation on the bottom. Swapping mutation just changes the execution order of the tasks in a chromosome that are competing for a time slot. So as you can see here, task zero and task one have switched positions after the mutation. So before the mutation, it was T0, T2, T1, and after the mutation, it was T1, T2, T0. Um, the other type of mutation addressed is replacing mutation. And with this type of mutation, another service or virtual machine is given a task from an individual. So the task is randomly selected from the chromosome or the string, and the virtual machine is randomly selected to replace it, the current service, as long as it's able to execute the task. So if you take a look at the picture, you can see that T2 falls into service type A, which can be executed by all of these virtual machines. So the virtual machine that's randomly selected um, needs to be able to execute the task in order to be assigned the task. And um, after the mutation, you can see that T2 has been switched to virtual machine two. So fitness functions. As stated earlier, the fitness function is used to calculate a fitness value. 
that is used to determine how good an individual is compared to the rest of the population. Before calculating the fitness value, we still need to use the time slot assignment method to determine the start and end times for each task. So when calculating the fitness values for our individuals, we will need to measure the two factors we are attempting to minimize, cost and time. The two functions above are used to evaluate cost fitness and time fitness separately, but are combined for the final fitness evaluation. Um, and these functions both use two binary variables, uh, beta and alpha. And so if there is a budget constraint, then alpha is one and beta is zero. But if there is a deadline constraint, then alpha is zero and beta is one. However, these values can be adjusted. If we are minimizing both cost and time, to favor whichever is more important or which is more valuable. Um, in the cost function, C of I is the completion time of I. B is the budget of the workflow. And max cost is the most expensive solution in the population. And in the time function, um, T of I is the completion time of I. D is the deadline of the workflow, and max time is the largest completion time in the population. So the final function states that if the fitness value of costs I or time I is greater than one, then use the top value, or else you just use the bottom value and multiply the two uh, F function fitness values to get the final fitness value. So in conclusion, once you have finished your genetic operations of crossover mutation, you will continue to generate offspring and reapply the gen genetic operators consecutively. Once you achieve a fitness value that is satisfactory, you can apply the solution in a real-world application that will be able to pull put your solution to the test.